can do that. And for and by the way, for people uh, behind the scenes here, since Helen invited Phil, but I also know Phil, we had a we had a thumb wrestle to be uh, to host a co-host today, and that's why Kara is off in the background because <laughs> we, we just decided we'd both do it. <laughs> So who we have is, our favorites. We do. Who is <laughs> so. Phil Ferguson? Uh, he ha, he has been an investment advisor representative since ninety six, the other century, and is the president of Polaris Financial Planning LLC. Who sometimes sponsors Sicon, by the way, which is where I met Phil originally. Uh, Phil is also a long time activist in the secular movement. He's been on the board of the Secular Student Alliance, the Atheist Alliance International, and serves served as a treasurer for the Reason Rally in 2016, when John Delancey made a most amazing speech. He is an active member of many of the national organizations and has helped start three local groups. He also gives talks to local groups and large conventions. He's presented at the TAM, the amazing meeting that is, and also Skepticon, just to name a few. Welcome, Phil Ferguson. You have to unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself. There Hello. you go. How are you? Buongiorno. 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 Buonasera. Buenas noches. Como esta? Bien. Molto bene. So, Phil, what are you going to be talking about tonight? <laughs> Forgive me for the terrible segue there. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's why, I'm, that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, prompt me on. I don't normally need that, but I'll take it. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of my, what I call, loss of faith story. Uh, although after having listened to several recent episodes on RFR, I don't know that I'm worthy. <laughs> um, there have been people on that have had horrible, life-altering potentially life ending experiences. And I was so delighted to hear their stories. Uh, my parents were Methodist. I grew up Methodist. I, people ask me, were you ever really a Christian? Like the 12 year old me thought he was, I guess. I didn't even know that there was a choice at that time. I started going to confirmation classes and uh, I know some organizations have two years of confirmation. The Methodist, it's only nine months. I think it's coincidental that that's the human gestation period, but I don't know. Uh, nine months and I would ask questions and the, uh, the youth pastor didn't know how to answer them. My parents didn't know how to answer them. My school teachers refused to answer them, which I'm thankful for at this point. But when I was you know, younger, I was pissed off because I'm like, well, can't people just give me straight answers? And so finally, they, everyone decided I should sit down and talk to the minister. So I went in his office and we talked for an hour. And uh, one of the most horrible, painful hours in my life ever, and all of our clothes stayed on. That's right. Okay. Too Catholic? Too soon? Um, <laughs> it, uh, the one thing that really struck me at some point I had asked, um, you know, I said something about, I don't, I'm just not buying it. I'm not, I'm not believing it. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not rendering an opinion for anybody else. But if I'm supposed to get up in front of the uh, congregation and say, yes, I believe this and I always will, um, I'm not ready for that. And the minister said, well, just do it for your parents. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is a game. This, this is just something we do. This is for show. I, I, I apologize. I thought this was serious. I thought my life depended on it. My eternal salvation depended on it. And now I hear, just do it for your parents. So I said, well, I'm under no compulsion to actually follow through with what I promised because it's meaningless. And so I went up on the, speci the special Sunday and raised my right hand, put it over on my heart. What did, I don't even remember what they did, but I had to eat a wafer and uh, poof, I was a Methodist and an atheist. That, that was the moment I knew I'm, I'm done because if it's a game, why are we all doing it? And I remember thinking distinctly, how is it that someone that's been trained as a minister uh, for years and years and years went to seminary school? Now, that's a funny name. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> seminary. Went, went to seminary school and can't answer the basic questions of a 13-year-old. How, how is it possible that I could come up? How can I formulate a question that was unanswerable by a professional? Because if, if I went to an accountant and asked a 13-year-old question about taxes, I bet they could give me an answer. I went to an attorney, they could give me an answer. If I went to the coach of a football team and asked him how plays work, to, you know, they could give me an answer. Why is it that religion is the one place in our lives that we're probably okay with not getting clear answers? That, shouldn't that 
be a red flag that something is weird, something's going on. So I went to finished high school, finished college, would have uh, arguments and debates on a regular basis in college. And uh, I was pretty hardcore, starting atheist clubs, you know, changing the world kind of stuff. And then you get married. And uh, my wife and I decided together that I would pretend to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran for the benefit of the family and for the benefit of the kids. In hindsight, I was a fucking moron. But, you know, I was there. I had my chance to say, no, I didn't want to do it. But we did it. And I pretended to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. I ended up getting on the Missouri Synod Lutheran private school board. I was the treasurer for three years. And I actually helped the school avoid financial collapse. So I have a lot of shit to make up for. Um, But the whole time, and and one of my topics I love to lead into is about uh, how to talk to kids, how to share with kids, and and maybe not even your kid. Just depends on how far you want to take this. And the first time I gave this talk many years ago, when I mentioned the title of the talk, there were there were gasps in the office, in the audience. <gasps> you can't do that. You can't tell people how to help their kids leave religion. Well, you know what? People in religion are doing it. A lot of people that benefit from RFR experience that, whether they wanted to or not. They were compelled to learn these things and believe these things and, and can have lifelong trauma, uh, suffering from images of hell or other problems that were foisted upon them that probably aren't even real, but yet you can't get over it because that's what you were taught as a kid. So uh, I just have a uh, a couple slides here that I give in a presentation. I'm not going to share it with the group, but I did want to go over it. Um, So what I do is I talk to people about when this presentation about how you can help. And again, it can be, you can do this for you. You can do it for your kids. You can do it for your friends, kids, your kids, friends, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, but be careful. You don't want to be a jerk about it. Um, be careful that you don't get uh, cut out of the relationship with the uh, with the child or the young adult that you're attempting to help out of their religion. Um, so I have a couple of suggestions that you could try. One is Steve Spangler Science. You can Google it. I get no commissions. I get no pay. But you can find fun toys that are science and entertaining on that website. And one of the things that we bought from there was uh, a, a big collection of color beads that they're all white but in ultraviolet light like a black light or the sun they change colors and i distinctly remember having my daughter's entire cheerleading squad over in high school and we went into the basement and had only um regular light bulbs so nothing ultraviolet and they could pick these beads out and make a secret coded bead bracelet but you couldn't see what the colors were until you went outside. So they would make the bracelets and it just looked like white beads. And then they would walk outside or I would turn on a black light and it would be all these different colors on this little bracelet that they had made. And so they're like, well, how does that work? And so we have a conversation about the electromagnetic spectrum with uh, young cheerleaders that probably at this point were already kind of pushed out of science because it's not for them, it's for the boys. But yet they're coming to me and saying, I want you to explain this. I want to know how this works. And, and I saw that as a big, big win. Um, when our kids were little, my wife was still religious. And so they were going to church in Sunday school. And again, I agreed to it. So, you know, whatever. But I also, I don't want to say undermined what they were being taught in school, I guess. I so guess Phil, how, how yeah. religious is a Missouri Senate Lutheran? Is this young earth creation and Bible literalism? Um. Yeah, yeah, they they would uh, say that, you know, they might say something like, if you sat down and read the Bible in its native English, it's self-revealing. So if you just read it, you would become a Missouri Synod Lutheran. So anyone that's any other religion is obviously interpreting the Bible because they're the only ones that don't. Um, They had a real tough time with women voting on stuff. And some congregations didn't let them. And things went better when the women didn't vote. So I've heard um, they could be underpaid teachers for kindergarten in the first five grades. Maybe that, that seemed okay place for women to be. Um, they could be in the office as a clerical, but not, not as ministers. No, mm. that, that, that wasn't cool. Um, they definitely weren't equal. Um, and I remember one time asking the uh, eighth grade science teacher, 
what what happens when you get to uh, into biology, evolution kind of stuff? And she said, well, we do let the kids know that there's some scientists that think the earth is older than 10,000 years. Uh, I was like, what? You tough some of them. Um, so that's why the science games, the science experiments are fun. And you don't have to make it about being out of religion. You can just say, this is how the world works. And maybe at some day they'll figure it out for their own without you ever having said anything. Uh, another thing we did when our kids were young is that uh, the playroom they were in had this old, old timey machine with DVD player, I think it was called, where we would put on like BBC's dinosaur documentary or uh, nature, all these high res, beautiful pictures uh, with David Attenborough. And you can't go wrong with David Attenborough, just telling the kids how shit works. And my idea was when they hear an idea like the earth is young, they can go, that's stupid. <laughs> I, I know that's not the case. I also recommend a lot of TV shows, science fiction. Um, when I first did this presentation, it was a more contemporaneous show. And now it's getting kind of old. Star, uh, Stargate, Stargate SG-1, which I said was 10 years of killing false gods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's rumored, it's believed that they uh, got kicked off the air after the 10th year because the uh, ninth and 10th season was a little too close to home <laughs> with Christianity. Um, Scooby-Doo cartoons because there's always something mysterious and supernatural. And at the end, it's just the dude who runs the roller coaster or the water slide, you know, it's, it's, so you find out it's, it's not the case. Um, what is, what is the cartoon with the kids? That's totally not for kids. Um, it's escaping me. Somebody help me. You need more than that. Yeah. Any more than more kids than... <laughs> South Park. Thank you. South Park. Uh, <laughs> South Park, especially when they go into episodes about religion. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. Anything that's a, a book about evolution, about science. Um, there's a, a book by Daniel Loxton called Evolution, which is a, a very beautifully illustrated book about how evolution worked. So you can sit kids down and explain to them. Um, Richard Dawkins, who sometimes says things that I don't like nowadays, but um, has great books. Uh, J.R. Becker, who's been on my podcast a couple of times, has done uh, a series of children's books called Annabelle and Aiden where he talks about uh, things about gods and biology in a way that kids can understand. Um, another favorite is uh, Bruce Betts, my first book on planets. There's a whole series of these, my first book on X, my first book on Y. Did, um, you, did you meet Bailey Harris at Psycon who has the series, uh, My Name is Stardust? I, I did, yes, yes. Um, great, great books. And it's delightful that there's so many books now I can't list them all in a presentation. Mm -hmm. So go, go find them ask questions. Uh, another one of my favorite from years ago um, was the brick Bible. The end, basically the entire Bible done in Legos. <laughs> what? What? You don't know about that? What? Brandon Powell Smith is, is the, the creator of this. And the story that I, I was explained was explained to me, although the story is not commonly used anymore, but um, Brandon was in Burger King and God showed up and said, I want you to retell my story, but with Legos. <laughs> and so you can get these really thick books of the entire Bible or most of the Bible, most of the Bible stories covered in uh, dioramas of Legos, high quality, high quality work, high quality photographs. And these books got picked up by uh, um, Walmart and uh, Sam's Club and put in their little bookstores until people started reading them. <laughs> Because he's edited out anything too explicitly graphic, but I mean, there are scenes with little uh, little Lego foreskins that are just so dark. <laughs> it, oh, those are the little round parts of the blocks that yeah, are just yeah, yeah. They're, they're just laying on the ground. They're counting them up, you know, because they captured all these enemy yeah. the warriors. Hmm. Uh, one of my favorites always is the story of uh, of Lot, the only guy worthy of saving from Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. and yeah, the angels come and he invites them into his house and a, and a mob of men mm. who, who want to do things with these angels. Now, keep mm. in mind, the, the cities are Sodom yeah. and Gomorrah. Sodomy mm. comes from the word Sodom. Mm. And uh, Lot goes outside and does the noble thing and says, they're my guests. You can't, you can't touch them. But here's my daughters. Yeah, my virgin daughters. The next, there you go. the next day, Lot and his daughters and his wife leave the town. The wife turns around and sees the destruction after she was told not to and turns into a pillar of salt. Some have conjectured that was the only way to get out of the marriage. 
<laughs> she was able to get out of the marriage. And of course, Lot and his two daughters go into uh, hiding in some caves. And the daughters, this is, this is a beautiful example of what the Bible thinks of women. The daughters are lamenting that their father has no descendants because they don't count. They're women. And so the only solution that they could come up with is to get Papa drunk, get him drunk, and have a little bit of party, and that's all in the brick, the brick Bible. You should get it. absolutely amazing stuff. So I'm wondering about the flood. Uh, do uh, do Legos float like, or, or do they get drowned? Uh, in, the world? <laughs> in the book, they drown. Mm. Well, ninety nine point nine percent of them drown. Mm -hmm. Although you remind me, a great movie, and I mean great. It's uh, radio air quotes. Great movie. The uh, the Ark movie that came out. I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. Where, where Russell Crowe is chasing Hermione on the, on the roof of the boat, trying to kill her two kids with daggers. Oh, great, great movie. Absolutely. Uh, huh. uh, another thing um, I, sh I had my kids listen to was uh, Julia Sweeney's Letting Go of God. You know, and the, these oh, are a little yeah. dated because my kids are older now, but you can find things like this. W when I bought the, uh, the double CD two hours long, my wife said, You're not going to play that for the kids, are you? Oh, no. I wouldn't do that. So the first time me and the kids are alone in the car, I pop it in the CD player in a car. And the really funny part, if anyone's not heard this, you should. It's worthy of listening to uh, Letting Go of God by Julia Sweeney. Yes, the character that played Pat on SNL. But there's this scene where she's at a youth retreat. And instead of saying God, because that sounded so formal, they decided to name God Fred. And as she explained it in this monologue, the children would go, Fred is love. Fred is love. Fred is love. So a couple of days later, all four of us are in the car, me, the two kids, my wife, and we're in Southwest Missouri. And we drive by a furniture store called Fred's Furniture. And my kids are in the back seat and they start going, Fred's Furniture is love. <laughs> furniture is love. Oh, and your wife and was I'm there. I'm driving. And my wife's sitting in the passenger seat. She goes, what are they doing back there? Mm. My, you know, kids, who knows? <laughs> who knows what they're doing? She goes, no, I, I really Kids I say really the darndest know. things. Yeah, what, what, I really want to know what are they doing back there? And I go, you know, how's your mom? She doing all right? You know, just anything, try to change the subject. And she's like, no, I want to know. And I'm trying to figure out how to say it. My son just jump, jumps out and says, oh, dad played this thing called letting go of God for us. My wife turned to me and she goes, you played it for them. And I said, it was in the car. I, I wasn't paying attention. It just on. And she says, well, I guess I should hear it now. And I said, okay. And I hit play. So for the next two hours, she heard it and the kids heard it again. And after it was done, she goes, I don't know what I was worried about. That was perfectly fine. No big deal. Oh. Uh, other things for kids, magic tricks. Absolutely fantastic. I bought this little trick for my daughter. Anyone who knows a little bit about magic, it's a, it's a paddle trick. It's a little stick that uh, you can change the color of the beads or the gemstones in it and we went to a magic shop which is where you wildly overpay for magic tricks but you get a free gift a free magic show so that's how it kind of all works out and the person behind the counter demonstrated how this works and my daughter says she wants it so i buy it for her and when we get back to the house she runs to her room and she opens up the package and she reads the notes and then she comes down and she's like dad dad can you come help me I, I can't figure out how I can't make it work. And so we go up to her room and I read the instructions. And of course it slaps me in the face because it's so simple. Like good, any good magic is really simple. It's just, it's a trick. And, and it's, it happens. Something happens before you even think it happens. And so I was walking her through it and she goes, this is stupid. It's just a trick, which is very often the response people get when they find out, which is why magicians often won't tell you how they did the trick because once you know it's not magic it's stupid it's so it's so simple that you get mad and embarrassed that you got tricked by it so she said i don't want it anymore i said well can i have it she goes yeah i don't care so over the next few days i would show some of her friends this trick and they'd be amazed and then of course she's like i want it back <laughs> it's my trick <laughs> so she would show her kids for several months all of her friends um but it was one of those things that she got to experience in, in, in real time that things aren't always what they seem. So you can get magic tricks for your kids. Um, 
If you have kids that are, uh, you're available to share YouTube videos with them, you know, you can find something uh, from uh, different shows that, uh, that have people on like, I was on Mr. Deity many years ago. If anyone doesn't know that show, that I was the saw guy the that, episode. He saw he, that he saved 10% and he unfortunately misinterpreted it and thought I said that everyone should give him 10%. So <laughs> it's your blame. fault. The tithing yeah. is your fault. Yes. So, so that was good fun. But you know, these are just different things you can do different uh, YouTube videos, different, uh, I guess they have the TikToks now, whatever the fuck that is, uh, and different things you can share and find humorous stuff that, you know, subversive. <laughs> if I'm choosing it, maybe you find something that's just um, thoughtful and, and they can think about it. Um, but, you know, those are some ideas of things that you can do to help kids out, maybe teach them how to, or show them how to think, how to look at the world differently. Take them to uh, a religious institution that's different than the one they grew up in if you're permitted to, if you're allowed to. So if they're Methodist, take them to a Lutheran church or a Baptist church, and they'll see that they're not all the same. And when they realize that they're not in the one true religion, which is 90% of the population, I, I met a Mormon once that thought 50 plus percent of the American population was Mormon. Whoa. And they were devastated to find out it's not even 2%. And uh, that was, that was mind altering for them. Well most often I talk to Christians on the helpline who think that everyone else is going to hell except for their little tiny denomination. Yeah. But every once in a while I get somebody on the opposite of the spectrum where they're a Christian and they think all Christians think the same and they've always thought the same. It's like that blows my mind more than anything. It, it, it is pretty amazing. Um, the other thing that I do on my, my show, uh, the podcast by the way is The Phil Ferguson Show. Uh, I talk about religion, politics, and uh, money, the three things you probably should not discuss with your family. And they're all mixed in between. And one of the things I like to do is uh, apply the same rules of skepticism to investments. And if you guys are okay, I can, I can do an example right now that will take a few minutes, but it's, it's pretty fun. Sure. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Get and I also want to- I'm in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so the category well, you left out of there, Phil, though, was skepticism. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, Scooby Doo covers that. Well, you said religion politics. Is religion politics and at least skepticism. Oh, I, I see. I see. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I see skepticism as the overall umbrella that is applied to all those three topics. Mm. How's that for now? Okay. And since Helen has volunteered to help with this math. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Are you volunteering me? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm volunteering you. Um, so we don't have monopoly money, which, you know, if I do this in person, someone will have monopoly money. Um, so what you're going to have to do is get a pencil and paper or pen or a spreadsheet. Can I use my calculator on my computer? I believe you can. Okay, good. All right. Then I don't have to write. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to tell you all the good things about a thing called guaranteed mutual funds. Now, before anyone thinks this is an actual sales pitch, I'm giving you the sales pitch so you know what you might hear. And then I'm going to give you, like Paul Harvey might say, the rest of the story. So I'm going to tell you only the good things to start with, because that's what a salesperson would do. So guaranteed mutual funds. And of course, it's got to be good because in the title, it says guaranteed, right? Yeah. Sounds great. And so it is a mix of the U.S. stock market and guaranteed U.S. government bonds. So you can make money, but they also guarantee that it will never go down. Sound pretty good so far? So they use the best bonds and the stock index. And of course, they give you a 72 page prospectus and they ask you to sign the last page and they tear that out for you to confirm that you read all the rules and regulation, just like operating software for your Mac right? or for Windows. We, we all read all of that, right? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I have not sold my soul to any corporation whatsoever. <laughs> and of course, this investment has a guaranteed minimum return of 40%, which is 4% a year. And the really good math people who are listening will know that 40% over 10 years is not 4% a year, but 3.34. Just work with me. Uh, and this is one of those little things where a salesperson doesn't need to know how to do math. A salesperson doesn't need to understand what they're selling. They get paid to sell it, not to understand it. And so I love taking endless products like this on my show, uh, The Phil Ferguson Show, where I break down the mathematics and I read all the documents. Well, at least I skim 
because I get a 150 page insurance contract. I, I can't read that either. So what you're going to do, Helen, is you're going to invest $100 because you, you, you've come up with $100 you want to invest. Okay. So that's what you're going to start with. And you're told you're going to make 40% on that $100. So at the end of 10 years, your expectation is to make or to have in total. Give me a number. Um, so if I'm going to, hold on, I'm going to do the math. <laughs> yep. All good. Or equals. And times 10. Well, I think you're making it too hard. You're, you're going to start with $100 and mm -hmm. you're going to make 40%. I'm going to be 40%. So it should be 400. 140. 140. Yeah, you were close. Oh, I times wrong because I forgot my decimal point. That, that's, okay. Okay. that's the part that makes this more entertaining than me just explaining math. Okay, like, good. Watch Helen do bad math. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate you making that intentional mistake just to make the listener feel like they're part of the presentation. That's great. Well, that's, that's why I'm here. That's a <laughs> great, make other people great feel reason. better. Thank you. So you're expecting the $140 at the end of the 10 years. Right. Now, one of the things that might have been mentioned, it's definitely in the contract, but you have to pay what's called a load on this investment. Now, I like to call it a load of BS, but it's called a load mm -hmm. and it's 8%. So you, you started with $100 that you were going to invest, but the load is 8%. So $8 comes right off the top before the investment even starts working for you. So that's 92 and bucks. I see, now you jumped ahead of me. You're, you're not actually investing 100, <laughs> you're investing 92, huh? See, I see what you did there. Now, the funny thing is the 40% that you're going to make, you're not going to make 40% on the 100. You're going to make 40% on the 92. And so you lose $8 on day one and you lose eight or $3 more over the 10 years than you thought you were going to make because you didn't invest 100, you invested 92. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So you have 140 minus eight minus three but it gets better. I think this is magic. The money is invested in uh, mutual funds and the average expense for a mutual fund might be 1.3 to 1.5%. This is a little higher, 1.8%, but it's okay because it's such a wonderful product that you're going to love it. And that's just 1.8% per year on the hundred that you didn't put in. And that's, uh, we're rounding 10 years. That's $18. So you got to pay another $18. Okay. So you have 140 minus eight, minus three, minus 18. You good? Three. Okay. So 140 minus. Minus eight, minus uh, three, minus, eight, minus, minus three, 18. Minus 18. So okay. this gets me down to. No, don't, don't spoil it. No, oh, I'm don't spoil it okay. Be quiet. I'm going to no, be very we got, quiet. We got more. I know it's hard. No, that's okay. I, I Nikki, stop doing thing. math of the thing. <laughs> uh, the next thing is that there's insurance that you have to pay on this investment mm -hmm. because it's guaranteed. Guaranteed by what? Guaranteed by you. They may not have mentioned that at the beginning, but it's true. You have to pay another 1.5% or $15 over the 10 years. So you have to subtract out another 15. Okay. Oh, we're negative. Shh. Now, <laughs> Here's, here's the part that I absolutely adore. The vast majority of the money is invested in a thing called zero coupon bonds, which I'm not going to go into here, but if anyone wants to know more, they can always email me. But the zero coupon bonds appreciate in value over time, and you do get the gains, but you also have to pay all the taxes that are due. And you don't pay the taxes at the end. The IRS has decided they don't want to wait. And so they created a whole new category many years ago called imputed interest. So they calculate the amount of money you would make each year if you were to make money and you have to pay tax on that even before you have the money. Oh, isn't that great? Oh yeah. I like, I like spending money on money that I invested that I don't have anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. So your tax bill total due over the 10 years is $8. You have to pay taxes of $8 on this investment. Now we're going to pause and you're going to tell me you started with 100, you expected 140 10 years later, but what did you actually end up with? I think I did my math wrong, to be honest with you. I, I get 88. That's what 80. I got. I got 88. Okay, good. All right. I was, I, I was there. I knew you did. I, I, I never doubted for a moment. 
Thank you. Yep. <laughs> that makes me feel so, smarter. <laughs> so you have $88. So here is a situation where you invest 100. You think you're going to end up with 140. You end up with 88. And it's not just that your investment lost money. Your investment over that 10 years, if you had invested in the stock market, your $100 could have become $200 or $250. So you not only have the actual financial loss, but you have the missed opportunity. The opportunity cost, one could call it, where your $100 could have turned into two or 250. Instead, you have mm -hmm. 88. And it's happened slowly and gradually over 10 years, so you don't notice it. And then you get to the end of the 10 years, and you're like, I thought I started with 100. How do I have only 88? Mm -hmm. And the salesperson goes, oh, well, that didn't work out very well, but I've got a new thing for you. And there's another way to take even more money. How, so, is, how is this legal? Uh, because they don't break any laws. That's how it's legal. <laughs> it's like Bitcoin, I guess, at, at this point, uh, it's legal. There's not a law against it. Maybe it's unethical. Maybe it's immoral. And that does apply to both Bitcoin and, and guaranteed mutual funds. Um, is this all, so? Is this on the contract that you sign? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's, so it's that's all, how they get you. Code. They're like, well, it's a legally binding contract. They agreed. To, they agreed yeah, to it. Uh, yeah. Several years ago, there was a uh, a mutual fund company that got knocked around by the feds because, in the prospectus, they said that they would not let billionaires come in, and uh, trade in advance of the market opening and after the market closed, but they were letting people do that. And so they had to pay, you know, like a $20 million fine and fix the problem. Well, they fixed the problem by adding a sentence to their disclosure documents that says, we will allow billionaires to trade in your fund before you have the access to. So now it was disclosed. Um, just today, I was talking to one of my clients that before they were one of my clients was sold a thing called a private placement REIT. And uh, she put in $80,000 in 2016. And she just got an offer uh, to sell it for $12,000. <gasps> so again, not only did she lose 85% of her initial investment, she lost the opportunity cost of an entire decade of reasonable and modest investing. Um, I kind of like to think of my advice often as the turtle and the, the tortoise and the hare. Um, you're not going to make money overnight. And you may have noticed if you've ever met someone who's always trying to strike it rich, they're always trying because it, it often doesn't work. So you have to try again and again and again. And so I promote this idea of slow and steady, time-tested uh, stuff. And if you want, I can provide a list of books people could read on their own. Would that be helpful? That would be very helpful. Okay. I was waiting for like, yeah, Phil, that's a great yes, idea. Yes, yeah, Phil, that's a great idea. Let's share books. <laughs> I'm scrolling down here so I can make sure. I will, I will go ahead and copy and paste them into the chat if you want to talk about them. <laughs> sure, sure. The first book is The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Klassen. This book is uh, over 100 years old and purports to be about a story of ancient Babylon several thousand years ago. Uh, keep in mind, because of the time that this book was written 100 years ago, and the, the story is theoretically thousands of years ago, it has some opinions on women and other groups of people that may not be appropriate for everyone. And I'm talking about adults. So keep that in mind, but it's way of explaining how you can make money from money and why you would do that, I think is very valuable. It's something that a lot of people don't really know or understand how that works. And this book does that. And it's a, it's a short read. If you really low on money, it's on YouTube last I checked where someone read it aloud because it's out of copyright. So you can do that one for free. Uh, the next book is A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton G. And I have no idea how to say the last name, Malkiel. A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Um, this and the next book both came out either in the late 60s or early 70s. But thankfully, every four to six years, they're updated. So get a relatively current version of the book. And A Random Walk Down Wall Street will help you with terminology and understanding how markets work, and how, how the ec economics work, so that you have a very good foundation to kind of build your investing house. Um, the third book is Winning the Loser's Game by Charles D. Ellis. And that talks about everything that was in the previous book, but builds on it a little bit more, gives more concrete examples, and talks about how you can pretty much beat most people by trying to not beat the market. 
The fourth book is Common Sense on Mutual Funds by John C. Bogle, who was the founder of the Vanguard Mutual Fund Company. Um, and Common Sense, the title was specifically chosen as an homage to Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine's famous uh, Common Sense. And that book is pretty thorough, some math, a lot of math, charts, graphs, statistics, standard deviation. And it is assumed that you know a lot of the words and terms and things that are, are described in the free, three previous books. So if you don't know anything about investing and you pick up that book to start with, it's not really going to help you. You're not going to have the framework to process it properly. So I do recommend the books that you uh, just put in the chat be read in order. And I'm not sure how am I doing on time? Should I keep doing stuff or do you want to start taking questions? Yeah, no problem on time. Yeah, we're good. Uh, so right. have you found like when you're giving financial advice to people, um, if they, this is just a hypothetical <laughs> question, if they come from a religious background and they haven't had these skepticism skills, do they tend to go with what the person is trying to sell them before they do investments or do they actually you know, um, put their skeptic hats on and do the research, yeah. when, especially when it comes to money. I, I actually have a, I don't know if it's a quote, I'll paraphrase, uh, someone that came to me that had an advisor that was in their church and I was going through the investments that they had and explaining one by one how awful these investments were. And their response was basically, why, why would someone recommend something that's not the best thing for me? And I was like, really, <laughs> really, you, you don't, you don't see how it might be financially beneficial for someone to recommend something that wasn't good for you, but was good for them. They'd never even entertained the thought just like with their minister and with the lay lay teachers in our church, they're taught, we're going to teach you the truth. You're just going to believe it. And sometimes it creates, I don't know, not a dependency, but, but an expectation from the listener that. If you talk to an expert, they will always tell you what's in your best interest because that's what they've always told you. This is in your best interest. I'm going to protect you from hellfire. Um, I'm going to tell you what you need to know. And as long as you listen to me, you're, you're going to be okay. And then when they get in a sales environment and the salesperson explains things, it's, it's not just that they don't have a basic understanding of investments or economics, although that is problematic. It, it's this idea that the person who's telling me what to do with my money mm -hmm is doing it to make me money. They wouldn't possibly do it for some other reason. Why would they do that? And, and then this person also a few years later uh, called me up and said, I was talking to him, a friend of mine who's a real estate agent. And I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, what? Mutually no, exclusive. I know what you're going to ask me. I've done this for 27 years now. I know what you're going to ask me. And the answer is no. Well, you didn't give me a chance to explain it. Okay. Explain it. And so she went through all the pros and all the reasons she should buy a house, even though she can barely pay her apartment rent oh. and has credit card debt. And then when she went through a whole thing, I said, have, have you finished explaining what you wanted to tell me? And she said, yes. And I said, my answer is still no, <laughs> don't buy a house. Well, but, but wouldn't I make money? Wouldn't it go up in value? The real estate agent said I would make money. I disagree with the real estate agent, but Phil, that would mean that they're telling me to do something that might not be in my best interest. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> because they get a commission. It, it, it's, it's what they do. And um, maybe, a, maybe most of us would expect this from uh, someone selling me a used car, that there might be a possibility the car's not as good as they claim that it is. But you have to think a little harder to think that someone who wants to sell me a house might not be acting in my best interest. They might be acting in their best interest. And then it's even harder to think, especially if you've been brought up this way, that the, the person that stands in front of 500 people every week and who is beloved and respected and revered, maybe even, would possibly tell me something that wasn't true. How do you wrap your head around that if that's your entire life? And that, I think, drives a lot of the problems. But as Rob cleverly pointed out, it's all about the skepticism mm -hmm. and uh, kind of sitting back and saying, OK, I, I know what you've told me and I can investigate that. And I can research that and I can get back to you. But it also helps if you have some basic understanding about how things work so that something that's to me, obviously stupid and fraudulent, well, not fraudulent, a poor investment is uh, not going to work out for you. Did I answer the question, Helen? 
somewhere yes, in there. It does. Yeah, it, I you got there, <laughs> and that was the goal. Yay! Yay! I can take uh, other questions or talk about solar panels. So, um, oh my so God, solar of, panels! Every other ad on YouTube I get is "Don't buy solar panels if you live in these five states," and I have no idea what they're talking about. Oh, uh, the clickbait. And well, I also need to make, you also need to update your car <laughs> warranty, your car's warranty, Rob. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get those. My, uh, my neighborhood here in Florida, every few days I get someone knocking on my door to sell me solar panels. Me too. And, um, uh, one of the guys, a couple of weeks ago, I'm out on the front porch talking to him and he happens to throw out just randomly that he's a Mormon. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, don't do that. <laughs> And he said, why is that? I said, I could never buy anything from you. I cannot even take you serious now. And he's like, what, is, what does that mean? And I said, your, your religion is so trivially easily falsifiable that I have to wonder how you're able to function and get through your day, let alone <laughs> Ouch. 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 And he says, uh, could you say that again? I said, yes, Mormonism is so easily and trivially falsifiable that I, I have to doubt your sanity. Now, I'm being a jerk. I, I accept that. I clearly was not being socially polite in this setting. And he said, uh, well, that's rude. That's rude to say something like that to somebody. And I said, you know, I can see how you would interpret it that way. Let, let me give you an example. You and I are on the top, the roof of a 10 story flat building and you walk over to the edge and you think that if you walk off the edge, that you're going to be safe. That's what you really and truly believe. And I come along and I say, it's not safe. Don't walk over the edge of the bridge or the, off the edge of the building. And you still want to do it. Is it rude then if I stop you, if I tackle you, if I prevent you from walking off the building because you were going to do something based on what you believed, but I believed that it was going to harm you? Or am I pr protecting you? Am I doing something for you? And I said, I see religion the same way. I see it as something that over centuries has adapted itself, developed itself to hook its claws into your brain. And Almost like a virus. It, it is. And it messes mm -hmm. you up and changes the way you look at the world. And you, my Mormon friend, are that person who's willing to walk off the top of a building. And I'm the one here to help you. And I'm the one that's going to stand up and tell you, hey, you better look into it again. Because I think if you make a, even a mild effort a gentle application of skepticism, you will come to the conclusion that that religion is trivially easily falsifiable. And I don't think that's a rude thing to say. I think I'm helping you. And how did that end, Phil? How did that conversation end? Um, he, he didn't sell me any solar panels. I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, but we, we talked on my front porch for an hour. Wow. Because he, he was, it was nice enough. He was young enough that he was like, no one's ever talked to me in this way. So I'm curious, what else do you think about religion and my religion and, and how things work in the world? Because he gets canned answers. He gets answers that are designed to uh, elicit a result mm -hmm. from him. That the people who are educating him, talking to him, are trying to guide him to a certain thing. And I'm saying, no, man, think for yourself. Go do some research. Um, uh, I could talk about Bitcoin if you want. <laughs> My Bitcoin. There's, there's so short of actually, um, Cara asked a really relevant question. Um, what yeah. are some similarities between harmful religious beliefs and harmful financial schemes? How can we tell if someone is selling us something harmful if we aren't expect ec aren't an expert on the subject? Excellent, well formed question. Thank you so much. <laughs> it, it it can be tricky, but the similarities are there where someone is communicating with you. They're providing information to you for their benefit. And so you need to understand, and one of the funnest questions ever is to uh, ask the person recommending something to you, how much do they make? And uh, it'll, it'll be a, a little fairness here for me. Uh, I can speak politically, but it will be, it'll sound like Bill Clinton asking you what is, is. You know, they should be able to just say, I make X if I sell you this. Okay, well, just be straightforward, own it. I once had someone that told me they talked to their current advisor and they asked, how much do you make off of our portfolio a year? And the, the, the salesperson said that 
it was so complicated that they themselves didn't even know how it worked. And I thought, well, I, I can, maybe there's other things, but I, I see two options. One, they're telling you the truth and they don't honestly know how they get paid, which, okay, I'll assume that's true for a moment. Why the fuck am I trusting you for any financial advice? You can't figure out your own fucking pay. I'm sorry, that's, are you incompetent or are you a liar? Because mm -hmm. I'm betting they know how they get paid. People know how they get paid. And they're there on Friday wanting their freaking paycheck. And if the company says they work 38 hours and their timesheet says 40, mm. they're going to speak up and they're going to say, no, 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 you owe me some more money. And, and financial people are the same way. They know what they get paid. So if someone tells you that they don't even know how they get paid, I'm betting they're lying, but the alternate, I don't know that it's any better if they're so profoundly incompetent with mathematics and numbers that they can't actually tell you how they get paid. That's pretty sad. So uh, mm -hmm. we did pre-show, we talked about the uh, word uh, fiduciary, which can have slightly different meanings in different environments. So when you hire somebody or when you talk to somebody, you're considering to hire, ask them, are they a fiduciary? Will they act in my behalf, in my best interest? And then ask them to put it in writing. And when you ask them, are you a fiduciary? If they say anything other than yes, the answer is no. Because sometimes they'll give you a weaselly mm -hmm. thing. Like, well, with some investments I am and with some investments I'm not. Some investments you're not. What does it mean? You're going to be a fiduciary 10% of the time and 90% of the time you're going to fuck me? That's not a fiduciary. That, that's <laughs> right. a weaseling around the word. Um, and so you need to get someone that puts it in writing. Uh, years ago, I, I just realized when I was prepping for the show, that, that I've been doing this since 96. And I'm like, holy shit, does that mean it's 27? Did I do the math right? 27 <laughs> years I've been doing this. And when I started, I had studied for the uh, series seven licensing exam to be a broker. And I contacted the state of Illinois where I lived back then. And I said, I I've been studying, I wanna take this test. And they said, who's your sponsor? So what, what does that mean? Who's my sponsor? Well, a brokerage firm has to sponsor you. What? I'm not gonna go work for any brokerage firm. And so I called a few brokerage firms and I, out of my stupidity, my, my na naivete, I asked, hey, would you be my sponsor? <laughs> and they would like, why would we sponsor you to compete with us? Well, I, I just, I'm a nobody. I've just got like three, three people that want to pay me money, just sponsor me. And they're like, no kid, you want to come work for us? You know, we can talk about it, put you on contract. Wait. So I called back the state and I said, are you telling me that people in the industry have control over who can join the industry? That's not going to create any problems with women getting jobs or minorities getting jobs. No, not at all. Of course it does. It, it's, uh, it blew my mind. And she said, well, you could study and pass the series 65 licensing exam, exam where your company would be a registered investment advisor. And I, as Phil, would be an investment advisor representative. And it's basically the same thing as a broker, except you have to act as a fiduciary. I said, what do you, what do you mean? And she started to explain fiduciary to me. And I said, no, no, I, I get the idea of concept of fiduciary. Are you telling me that the other people don't have to be fiduciaries? Oh, no, no, they, they don't have to be a fiduciary at all. They can sell you complete and total utter shit that's going to take your portfolio in a negative direction, even when the market's up. And it's all totally legal. That's why nobody does a Series 65, because you have to be a fiduciary. And I was like, what? So, yeah, kind of a weird industry. Is there another question? Um, do you, actually, we can move into Q&A if you're ready, since yeah, we're, yeah. we're already there anyway. So we're going to move into Q&A, peoples. Um, Rob, do you want to take the first question? Yeah. So, all right. So you don't mean the uh, one where we're going to turn the microphones on yet. You mean just reading no, that, the questions? No, we're the doing list? the official Q&A, then we'll go to Hangout. Okay. You know how this goes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I do better with, oh, I do well with questions. So ask. Okay. Questions. Well, this is a tough one. Uh, we have someone who said, I have... Dyscalculia, dyscalculia, I have not heard that term, which I can barely do basic addition and subtraction. What is your advice on how I can understand finances? Um, I would lean towards trying to keep it really, really simple. And, and I had the book list. If you didn't hear them, they're in the notes in the chat. Um, maybe it'll be in the, the show notes when it's on YouTube or something. Mm. Um, you can try reading those books. If you really just can't 
function and look at different investments and figure them out, that's okay. You can beat 90% of all investors by putting 100% of your money in the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. That fund will essentially own every single freaking stock in the United States of America that traded publicly. You can get complicated with the international stock and, and doing different things, but you're going to beat most people with no effort. You said that pretty fast. What, what was that again? Yeah. Vanguard what? The, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. Hmm. Now, the only caveat I would add to that is when you start to get close to retirement, 12, 14 years before retirement, you want to start switching and having more and more percentage of your portfolio in bonds. I, I recommend a series of six different bond index funds. But again, mm -hmm. if this is a challenge for you, you could do the total stock market index fund and you can do a total bond fund. And then there's reasons why you could do better than that. But if it becomes a problem for you, do what you can. <coughs> Pardon me been talking all day uh do what you can and you're still going to beat most people that the trick is to not do anything too creative stick with really basic stuff and and one of the things i hate in the investing world is i don't sound old new ideas in my investing with stocks and bonds and index funds i'm not really hip on new ideas i'm really happy to miss out getting on a ground floor opportunity if I have a very reasonable expectation of a modest return, that's going to make me wealthy over time. So let me guess, you didn't, uh, you didn't go heavy into crypto? No, no. Matter of fact, it's funny. Uh, I was working with uh, Seth Andrews, whose show is, of course, The Thinking Atheist. And we did a one-hour segment on Bitcoin. And he says, uh, all right, Phil, we, we've uh, reached the hour mark. Can you wrap this up? And I'm like, dude, I'm halfway through. <laughs> So uh, he was kind enough to refer everybody to my show, my podcast, The Phil Ferguson Show, uh, where I did the part two. And so it was two hours on Bitcoin. And this was six and a half years ago. At, at that point in time, finding negative information or what I would like to call factual information about how cryptocurrency works was difficult. Very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I will watch videos and I never saw anyone with a tinfoil hat on. I think they had them on. Um, everyone was pitching crypto because they were already in crypto. And so maybe it was an accidental, unintentional pump and dump scheme like has never been seen on the face of the planet, except for maybe uh, tulip bulbs in the 1600s or whenever that was. Um, there's, no, there's no there there. There's something like 10,000 crypto tokens now. And the top 10 are 85% of the total market value. The other tens of thousands are completely worthless. Uh, like a, a Bitcoin aficionado at one point told me, Phil, I will agree with you that 99% of all crypto tokens are bullshit. I said, well, we 99% agree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just going to go one crypto further. <laughs> like the phrase one, yeah. one deity further, one God further. Uh, you, you've got to convince me there's something there and I'm not convinced. Matter of fact, I'm convinced just like my position with religion is there's no there there. Um, I take a little bit more of a bold stance that instead of just saying, prove your God exists, I'm like, I'm looking at a lot of evidence that says it's not even possible, but that's treacherous waters to get into. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing was after I did those two one hour segments, it was the most hate mail I had ever received for my podcast. Mm. And I criticize religion. I criticize politicians. I swear on my show. I get some pushback. I, I, I've used words or phrases that maybe aren't, an appropri aren't appropriate in today's day and age. And I try to adjust. But when I did those Bitcoin episodes, man, did I get the most vile and hateful email from people I know, people that I thought were friends, people that I still think are very intelligent. They're just blind in this one area. It's like mm -hmm. the emperor's new clothes. Only the smart people can see that Bitcoin has value. If you don't understand it, you must be an idiot. Okay. I'm an idiot because I don't understand it. Um, I think I do actually, but uh, I, I don't wow. think it's it's going to work out. It's, it's, it's eventually going to go to roughly zero, but I don't think it's going to happen quick because there's no, um, there's no real ruler. There's no, like a, if a company, if you buy a stock in a company and that company 
has negative earnings year after year after year, eventually it goes bankrupt. And at that point, poof, the company's gone, its stock goes to zero and it's over. There's always gonna be believers in Bitcoin, just like there's always gonna be believers in Yahweh and his son himself, Jesus. It's not gonna yeah. go away, so. So there was a question that was actually came up last, but actually I think it's a follow-up to what you said. Um, isn't the money system, economic slavery system, all smoke and mirrors anyway? So I guess, I guess it's like relating, what's the real difference between Bitcoin and like fake paper money? I, I When I get a question like that, and maybe I'm wrong here, um, my, my first thought is this is somebody that doesn't understand economics at all. And, and I'm not sure where to start. There, there's so much that, it's like when someone says, Phil, what do you think about fiat currency? Oh my God. There's, there's so much that, and you know, without being able to communicate back and forth with them, given the way the question is phrased, because I can see it here, um, is it all smoke and mirrors? No, see, that was easy, no is a short answer, but they're not going to buy that. They're not going to accept that as an answer. They're going to want to know why. Well, I don't know exactly what you're thinking. So, and, so, and so yeah. after this section, we'll turn the uh, recording off and let people speak to you directly. And this sure. is, this sure. is a person who generally uh, is happy to do that. So you might be able to get to follow up. on Yeah. That. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an, it's an important thing. Um, Cause I'll have, uh, I'll have people say something similar to this and, and I don't want to read too much into it. Um, but when I'm talking to people, they'll say, how is, how is, uh, Bitcoin different than the stock market? And when someone says that, that tells me they don't understand how Bitcoin works. And it tells me they don't understand how the stock market works. That, that's the only way you can frame a question in that way is you just profoundly don't understand. And I don't mean that you're stupid. I mean that you're ignorant. You're missing the information that you need that mm -hmm. would help you prevent you from asking a question that's nonsensical. Um, so for, for example, someone will tell me, Hey, Phil, I, I put $10,000 in Bitcoin and I made a hundred thousand dollars. Are you telling me that's a bad investment? And I'll say, no, I don't think it even rises to the level or, of being a good or bad investment. It's not an investment. They're mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean? And I go, well, let me give you another example. You go to the horse track and you bet on a horse that pays 10 to one and you put $10,000 on that horse and that horse wins the race and you go to the booth and you pick up a hundred thousand dollars. You made 10 times on your money in, in a couple of minutes. Was that an investment? No, that's a bet. Okay. So having more money at the end of the process than you had at the beginning of the process doesn't necessarily mean something is an investment. And they're like, well, no, of course not. That's, but that's what you started with. Mm -hmm. you, you, you are calling it an investment because you put in 10,000 and you took out 100,000. That doesn't necessarily make something an investment. It doesn't mean it's not an investment, but it doesn't mean that it is an investment. I think it's more like gambling. Um, and if you look really, and that's the nice thing about the book list, I think it'd be very helpful for people to understand. When a company goes public and sells stock, people buy those shares and the company has extra cash to build the business, to grow the business, whatever it is that they do. Mm -hmm. And then each year for a lot of companies, you get a dividend and the price of that stock goes up because the company over time becomes worth more and more money. Bitcoin doesn't do any of that. There is no dividend that it pays you in dollars. It doesn't produce anything. When its price goes up, it's only because someone else was willing to pay for the price, not because Bitcoin is more valuable. And I'll ask Bitcoin aficionados, is a Bitcoin more useful at $30,000 than it was at $15,000? And, and the answer was always like, what, what does that even mean? Well, exactly. Why, why is Bitcoin 30 instead of 15? Why is it 15 instead of 10? Why is it 30 instead of 64? Like it was two years ago. Why did, why does that price change? How are you coming up with that calculation? It, it's just some, what is it? Uh, golden hands, magic hands, whatever. And the mm -hmm. sparkles and rockets to the moon. That's why you're buying it. What, what, what does it produce? What does it create? What does it make? Um, that I'll get uh, concerns. People are like, well, fiat currency, there's nothing behind fiat currency. There's nothing behind the US dollars. Are you freaking kidding me? Did that really actually escape your mouth? There's a lot of power and influence behind the US dollar. One, it's what you need to pay your taxes. If you bought Bitcoin and sold it for a higher price, you're going to have to pay taxes on the gains. 
It's not going to be in Bitcoin. It's going to be in US dollars. And I can promise you that if Bitcoin ever got to the point where people were paying wages and salaries off the books in Bitcoin to avoid paying taxes to the US government, that day, that day is the day your business is going to get inspected and audited and probably shut down for tax evasion. So mm -hmm. Bitcoin can't succeed. It, it's, just, it's just not possible. Uh, additionally, it's inversely scalable. So if a generous per percentage of the US, uh, the global population starts to use Bitcoin, it'll use more energy than we use for every single car that we drive around. Why? What, what for? Just to mine it? It's stupid. Yeah, I heard, I heard that talked about in the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I think the energy is, and that just blows my mind. It's like, I, I it, guess it, I don't understand yeah, the technology I don't understand of that, that but I've heard that before. Like how much it is actually contributing to um, global warming and a bunch of other ec um, environmental issues, which I didn't think that yeah. cryptocurrency would. Well, cryptocurrency in and of itself doesn't. Bitcoin right. does. Right. And But um, to me, like, I'm like, isn't it all digital information? That's this, this shows my lack of information on Bitcoin. Cause I'm just yeah. like, sounds like a scam. <laughs> and I, that was basically my attitude. So, so I, I think the way to, to see how goofy it is, maybe is to, to break it down because Bitcoin is promoted by a lot of really, really smart people. Mm -hmm. um, but what it is, is it's a distributed ledger. So Helen, let's say I lend you $20. Okay. You owe me $20. Right. You and I agree that you owe me $20. Yes. And then we share that little note with Rob. And so Rob can look at it and he can go, yep, Helen owes Phil $20. So it's a distributed ledger. It's not just you and me agreeing. Everyone in the club agrees. And it could be a thousand people that have that ledger. So you can ask any one of them, how much money does Helen owe, owe Phil? It's $20. And so you're not dependent on a centralized system like me or Helen for keeping the information. Everyone has the information. So that's, that's a pretty cool idea and it might be useful in all kinds of different ways. Um, but then uh, they have this block, which is where they get the phrase blockchain. And mm -hmm. in a given block, there can only be so many transactions and Bitcoins are awarded to people for keeping the ledger, but only if they're the first to uncrack uh, a, a super secret code to then confirm that block. And those blocks are confirmed once every 10 minutes. And the problem is if you have 500 people trying to crack a code, if they crack it too fast, like say five minutes, it goes against the intent of uh, Bitcoin to have a new distribution of coins every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So they make the code harder and okay. harder and harder. And so now the only way to solve it is with entire banks of computers. And so oh. it's also not available to you for you to do on your computer anymore because you're not going to crack it first. Somebody else is because you're competing with the whole fucking world. And so consortiums form, big collectives form where a thousand people work together with all their computer power. And if any one person in that group cracks the code and gets five or two and a half or one mm -hmm. Bitcoin, they all have to share that revenue. But now you have a chance of getting part of the revenue and maybe paying for the electricity that you use. And so that's what drives the computer usage because you can't solve it I see. faster than 10 minutes. Now you can, and when someone does, the next block has an encryption or a security code that's even longer or harder to force it to be 10 minutes, even if a million people around the world are trying to solve it. And the million people around the world are trying to solve it because Bitcoin price went up. And so if I can spend $30,000 a day on computers and electricity, and I can make $40,000 a day by occasionally unlocking that code. And so that's called proof of work. So that's what theoretically makes Bitcoin valuable is all these people doing all this work and effort means that Bitcoin is not just handed out freely. You have to earn it just like you have to earn dollars, but Again, I asked the crypt, uh, Bitcoin aficionado, why is a Bitcoin better at 30,000 than 15,000? And if you accept that it's a currency, and I'll grant that it's a currency, it's not an investment, but it is a currency. It's a shitty currency. Because if I think my Bitcoin is gonna be worth a thousand times more next year, if I have crypto coins, what am I gonna spend them on? Nothing. I'm not gonna fucking use them. 
I'd have to be a fucking goddamn idiot to spend something that's worth $15,000 today if I think it's going to be worth $150,000 next year, right? right? I would never spend that. I'd have to be like dying of starvation or thirst before I would spend a fraction of a Bitcoin if mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be 10 to 1,000 times bigger next year. And then you get the problem with the, the retailer or somebody selling goods. If they accept Bitcoin or any other crypto, if its price is volatile, like a grocery store, usually the margin is three to 4%. Well, the value of Bitcoin can move five or 10% in a day. So you have the store and you're selling everything to everybody all at once. Um, and then when you go to turn in your Bitcoins, they're worth 10% less than what you thought they were when you took all the transactions. The profitability of your business is now more dependent on the price of Bitcoin than all the goods that you sell. So you're no longer wow. in a grocery store industry, you're in a Bitcoin industry. And so you look at that and you say, hey, I can predict how much money I'm going to make if I take dollars, but I have no idea how much profit I'm going to make if I take Bitcoin because right. the value changes so fast. So with inflation, high inflation or high deflation, mm -hmm. which can happen with different currencies around the world, Bitcoin is supposed to reduce that, but it's wickedly higher. Um, people complain that the U.S. can make more dollars. Well, Bitcoin makes mm -hmm. more dollars every ten, more coins every 10 minutes. So everything that they say it's going to solve, it doesn't. They say it's easy. It's not. They say it's safe. It's not. They say it's secret. Right. And thank goodness it's not because the FBI, working with 30 other agencies around the world, ha have been able to track down and arrest people that are sharing, selling, creating uh, abuse videos of children because those people were changing money back and forth with Bitcoin and not even trying to hide it because it was secret. Well, they got busted. Good, yeah. Rotten fucking jail, but they they found them. Because, anyway, this is yeah. and like I know you can talk about this forever, and I do find it very yeah. interesting. But we're um, we can take the additional questions that we have into the um, hangout, um, but we do have to finish up the show, Rob. <laughs> All right, so we're done. We're done reading them. I thought we had plenty. Uh, of do time. we have time? Mm, I don't know. Maybe we have we have time for like two more. <laughs> Okay. Um, right. Yeah. So we have one about teaching critical thinking to kids, which is what you started yes. with. I like to ask that one. Yep. So I, it's someone said, I like your idea of teaching uh, children critical thinking. Do you think it's wrong to teach children to believe in Santa, the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny and other uh, such fairy tales? Excellent. I'm conflicted, honestly. And, and having done it with my kids, we, we decided and there's no, we, there's no, maybe someone now has a roadmap on how you can do this because we were troubled by this very thing. What we decided to do was just passively let our children think they're Santa. So we didn't spend a whole lot of time and effort reinforcing it, but they would pick it up from the society that this is a thing. Um, and I remember distinctly at one point in time when my daughter, I don't know, five or six years old, I'm literally tucking her into bed. Um, after reading a story and she reaches up and she grabs my shirt and she pulls it and she goes, are you and mom Santa? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we told our kids very early on, which most people, I don't know, a lot of people don't like some of the ways we did parenting, but that's another fucking problem. Mm -hmm. But we told our kids, if you ever want the answer to a question and you ask for the information, I will give it to you. Good, bad, ugly, scary, whatever, mm -hmm. it's going to be the truth. Maybe, maybe it's a simplified version for what they can understand, but I'm going to sure. give them the truth as I think that it is. And I can be wrong and I'm mm -hmm. wrong a lot. But when she said that, I immediately said, yes, mom and I are Santa. And she's like, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so proud and she was so proud that she figured out something on her own. And so through that experience, by letting them kind of, I don't know, roast in, in this uh, clearly <laughs> false thing that the society believes, I think it can actually build some skeptical skills where you, you see something and you try to figure out how does that work exactly? How does a guy get to a billion houses in one night? Oh, it's not just six to eight hours. It's 24 hours because he uses the spin of the globe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So so he's got 24 hours, maybe 26 hours, 30 hours. 
still a billion houses is a lot. You know, and you go, well, let's do the math on that. Let's figure out how many houses he has to go to each second, you know, 20,000 or something, you know, each second, whatever the math works out to be. And you're not giving them the answer. You're helping them find the answer. Um, one time my daughter came home from Sunday school. hence the previous story where my kids were growing up religious. And uh, she had asked a question that the Sunday school teacher didn't like and uh, suggested to my daughter that she create a list of her questions and bring it in for next week. And then the Sunday school teacher could, uh, could go over this list and give her answers later and not disturb the class. And so my daughter came home and she said, give me a list of all the bad shit in the Bible. <laughs> I was like, wow, oh, okay. A, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, B, I'll, I'll show you how to use a computer and the internet to ask questions and look for things because I want this to be from you. I, I don't want to hand you a list and you take it to the teacher and go, my dad gave me this list because then they're just going to throw it out. But if you make the list, and she's like, okay, how do I do that? Wow. What a moment, oh. right? To, to help your child learn how to find mm -hmm. information, how to, how to guess and second guess and see, was well, there an agenda behind the person that's recommending this? And so she got about 10 or 12 things on this list and then, she stopped and she's like, dad I said, yes. She said, I'm thinking that the teacher wanted me to write it all down and give her the list. So I didn't ask in class anymore. Mm. Oh, why would they do that? I don't think that she wants the other kids to hear my questions. Smart. So I'm not going to give her a list, but I'm going to keep this list. And every week I'm going to ask one of these <laughs> questions. Oh, I, love I, I love your kid. <laughs> oh. There's that, uh, my son, when he was in the Methodist confirmation, uh, I'm sorry, Missouri Synod Lutheran confirmation, which is two years, unlike the nine months at Methodist. And before he went, he came to me and he goes, dad, mom says I have to go to confirmation and I don't want to go to confirmation. And I know you think it's all bullshit. Can you talk to mom and make it so that I don't have to go to confirmation? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know that Phil wants to be involved in this conversation. <laughs> so I came up with the idea maybe bad of me, maybe, maybe the best idea ever. I said, why don't you treat it as if you're an anthropologist and, and you study it as an observer and see what they say, see what they promote. And quite honestly, if you already doubt this stuff, this is going to be their last best chance to convince you there's something true there that they have the answers. And he goes, oh, okay. So I appealed. He always wants to know how everything works in detail. And you're not going to know how Missouri Synod Lutherism works any better than uh, going and uh, studying it. And maybe they're onto something, I'm missing it. You go check it out. And he goes, okay. So he was in the class for a couple of months. And uh, one day when I pick him up, his friend hops in the car and he goes, Mr. Ferguson, Andrew almost got thrown out of confirmation class today. <laughs> and I'm like, that's my boy. <laughs> so daddy's so proud. I don't know what he did, but my son gets in the car and I'm like, what happened? And he says, the minister said, minister, priest, minister, yeah. The minister said that the earth was not even 10,000 years old and that scientists use carbon-14 dating and there's flaws with carbon-14 dating and, co and contamination and all the stuff that can get in it. And my son, who happens to know about carbon-14 dating, he asked the uh, minister, hey, if you know all these things that are problems with car carbon-14 dating, do you think scientists know that there's these limitations and, and they're careful not to have these contaminations. And the guy goes, well, yeah, but you, you can't, you can't use carbon 14 dating to date the edge of the earth. And my son says, well, the funny thing is they don't because it's only effective for 35 to 50,000 years, because after that time period, the decay rate is zero because there's nothing left to decay. And he says, they do, Andrew, they, they use it to date the age of the earth. And again, 13 year old comes back. No, no, they don't. They might use the uranium lead decay cycle, but they don't use carbon. <laughs> and the guy goes, what? And he says, actually, there's probably five or six different decay cycles that can be used that have a frequency that's slow enough that you can get to 4.5 billion years. And they all come up with the, roughly the same result. Wow. I couldn't have even answered it that uh, explicitly. Yeah. And, and the minister said, well, you're assuming constant decay. And my son said, no, the decay is not constant. The rate of decay is constant. And he goes, that's what I said. And my son goes, no, it's not what you said. And if you don't understand the difference between the amount of decay and the rate of decay, 
then I don't know how to explain it to you. These are basic terms. And the minister's like, well, I, I'm just not accepting this carbon, this radioactive decay thing. And then my son says, well, what about VARVs? Do you know, anyone know what VARVs are? Var VARVs are layer of sedimentation put into a lake, usually by a rapid uh, speeding stream in the spring. Oh yeah, yeah. More rain. Talk, we talked about this at free flow. Yeah. All right, it's and, all come it, back to me, man. <laughs> and he dropped these layers and he's like, there's core samples that show the earth is more, way older than 10,000 years by VARVs. Uh, core samples with VARVs. You can look at matching tree rings and go back four or five times the age of your theoretical earth. You can do this, you can do that. And, and the minister got so mad that he left the room. And then uh, he comes back and he says, uh, I wanted you to know, I wanted you all to know that I, I got a little frustrated and that's not what the Lord wants me to do. Um, but I left the room, so I didn't say anything that we would all regret later. So we're going to go back to the lesson and we're not going to talk about radioactive decay or the age of the earth anymore. <laughs> and my son, being my son, says, well, if you wander in science again, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> wow. Wow. And that's where the guy almost popped him and it would just kick him out. Wow. And so as another example of a life lesson, beautiful. So my car, my son's in my car and he says, when we get home, I'm going to tell mom I'm not going anymore. And again, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I don't know if I want to be involved with that. I said, Andrew, um, do you think that your opinions are ever discounted because you're 13? And he said, yeah, of course. I said, okay. Do you think in general, people's opinions can be discounted if they're emotional? And he's like, yeah. I said, are you 13? Yeah. Are you emotional right now? I am. Okay. And he's like, I see where you're going with this, dad. Uh, I'm assuming you have a solution. And I said, I have an idea for you. Why don't you think about this? It's Sunday. And on Wednesday, you talk to mom after school when you're not emotional and you're calm and you lay out your, your uh, argument to her and see what she has to say. And he goes, okay. So I come home from work Wednesday. I had forgotten about this since Sunday. I come home from work on Wednesday and I walk into the house and my son's on a couch in front of me and I can see him doing this. I'm like, okay, what happened? And my wife says, uh, when I picked up Andrew from school today, he wanted to talk about confirmation class. And I said, oh, um, how'd that go? Well, he made a really compelling argument that confirmation class is actually making him stupider and that they're teaching him fake information and false information, stuff that's factually and just plainly visibly not true. And that uh, if, if we wanted him to go to college, it would probably be best if he didn't go to confirmation anymore. <laughs> And I said, oh, okay, okay well, what, well, what'd you tell him? She said, I told him he doesn't have to go anymore. I said, well, if that's what you think is best. <laughs> <laughs> she now knows the whole story. But the time, time. I was like, well, you know, honey, if that's what you want. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, my wife turns to our daughter, who's a, about a year, year and a half younger than our son. And she goes, uh, in a couple of weeks, you're going to start confirmation. And my daughter says, nope, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't going. And if you drop me off, I'm going to run away. If I can't run away, I'm going to burn the guy's house down. I'm not going to confirmation. And my wife goes, okay, fine. And my son is in the background like, hey, I went for six months and put up with that shit. And he can just say no. My wife's like, well, Andrew, you convinced me it was, it was not productive so, so she doesn't have to go. And he's like, oh, my God. I got to do first everything, right? Yeah, pathfinder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to um, to be um, on your story about your kids figuring out there wasn't a Santa and these running stuff, like we did it congenitally, but we did do the tooth fairy thing. And my kids gave up everything except for the tooth fairy because they got cash yeah. <laughs> with their teeth. And I'm like, oh, that's yeah. We actually clever. ask Phil that. So yes, when she said, oh, are you uh, and mommy saying yeah. you said yes? Did she then jump to any of the other? myths right there these two yeah. tooth fairy um that didn't come up in that conversation um i i think probably by that time in her head the only one that was worth further consideration was santa and, and once once santa was busted that oh she had already dismissed the I, giant hopping bunny who leaves uh, eggs and chocolates yeah and, i uh, i don't i don't remember any of those other ones being discussed as uh as something that was tangible and real even um, even at a younger age, it was, you know, it's just cute. 
yeah, just kind of like, cultural. I think, like Kai was six or seven, and then they were like, "Well, I'm going to tell Andrew," and I was like, "Well, your dad might not like that because it's a divorced household." So I said, "I go, let him just." figure it out on some but it la that lasted like two weeks and then like they blurted it out to their brother like santa's not real <laughs> so uh, it just popped in my head another religion story and it ties in with the parenting thing um a good friend of mine um he was an atheist still is and his wife was not and still not an atheist and they agreed like i had agreed to send the kids to the religious church to religious school they were going you know to services two three times a week and he just stayed out of it and he didn't make any of the creative uh, ideas that I did where, you know, I was constantly exposing my kids to uh, the alternate uh, of religion, which I call reality. He just stayed out of it. He didn't say anything. And when the kids were like 15, 14, he sits them down and he says, okay, all this time you've heard, you know, about religion and what mom, mom thinks, but I want to tell you about what I believe. And the uh, oldest child was the daughter. And she said, we were told this day would come and that we weren't to listen to you. And they got up and left the room. And he called me and he's like, I just lost my kids. And I said, no, you lost them years ago. You just found out mm -hmm. that you lost your kids. Mm -hmm. It's already, it's already too late game over. And he's like, well, what do I do now? I said, well, I, I don't, I don't actually have a good answer. The only thing I could think of is uh, just be the best dad you can and let them know that they can come talk to you whenever they want to. And, and maybe, maybe when they're 18, maybe when they're 21, maybe when they're 32, they're going to go, Oh, I got questions. I never really talked to dad about this. And so, cause if you become the jerk, if you push too hard and get kicked out, you, you got nothing, but he was, he was distraught. He, he was in tears. Cause he's like, how did, how did, how did this happen? And it's so, it's mm -hmm. so nefarious. And like I said earlier on, it's a system that's designed and dare I say evolved over hundreds and thousands of years. It's a system that works. You know, mm -hmm. you, you tell a seven-year-old in the Catholic church, they're an adult now and they can sin. You freak them the fuck out. Uh, other religions tell them about hell and you're going to burn in hell and you have an obligation to tell your, your kid, your friends, um, and adults still do this. I mean, mm -hmm. occasionally I get people knocking on my door that want to promote their religion while selling, selling solar panels, apparently. Um, but they, they think this is how it works. And if you get a religion, uh, for example, I love this, uh, in the United States, a group called the shakers, uh, which m maybe no one knows anything about. I um, do. I'm, I'm descended from French shakers. Well, you're an unusual <laughs> one. Then, I know I am. <laughs> we all know you are. Um, yes. I, speaking, and I embrace it. <laughs> yeah, sh shakers uh, weren't allowed to have sex and men and women were kept separate. Well, if you're in a religion that doesn't have children. Wait, wait, even after marriage. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was, it was taboo. Well, so that, that's self-destructive. Totally. I don't get it. Well, when you compare it to a religion that breeds followers, yeah. it's definitely at a competitive disadvantage if you're talking about a numbers sure. game. And that's why religions like Mormonism and baptism and Catholic, they all know, don't use condoms, don't use birth control. It, it may not be the best thing for you, the parents. It may not be the best thing for your kids, but it's the best thing for us. Mm -hmm. And we're telling you things that are in our best interest and not your best interest because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, we're going to have more people following this religion, just like we have more people following this religion because the people before me convinced your grandparents to have 14 kids. So it's all about self-preservation of that religion. And even if it's accidental, religions that have more children have more followers. It works in Islam. It works in Christianity. It works in Mormonism. If you oh, find don't don't, that, don't forget Orthodox Judaism. I, I see yeah, you any, girls any who look like they're that, twenty with eight kids already. Yeah. Yeah. Any anyone that uh, any religion that doesn't encourage births, a lot of births, and indoctrination of the children, is a religion that's going to not grow and might shrink. And like the Shakers, just one day go poof because there's nobody left or very few left. I don't they understand never... how they didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, there was. 
it, it kind of evolved because there were people dying, like par- like parents that were, and there was all these orphans and they created a religion to, it was part of the religion to adopt them in to increase their numbers of these children that didn't have parents and create the most part of the community. But eventually they started dying out as politics and laws changed and, you know, that sort right. of thing. So, I mean, it's not a very sustaining system if you're not fucking and making babies. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, it, it, it's harder to spread your religion if you don't have people born into it. Uh, one of the things that I will often tell people, and I, I, I do stand by it, but it's meant to be partially provocative. But um, if people ask me, you know, are you an atheist? And I'll, I will tell them that I am an evangelical atheist. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that I think I'm right. Most people think they're right. That's just part of being a human experience. I think I'm right. And honestly, I think the world would be a better place if there were more atheists, if fewer people believed in religion and we could look at the world as it actually is based in fact, based on skepticism, based on science, and solve some of our fucking problems by just looking at what they are and not being tied to religion, not being told what to eat, when we can eat, um, not being told that if I take a dove and sand from the temple floor, I can test a woman to see if she was faithful. Um, you know, just Ooh, that's the stuff. abortion reference. Yes, that's yeah, the only yeah. abortion like, reference in the whole Bible. How to have an abortion. Yeah, how to have an abortion it involves the priest. So every Catholic yeah. church now should be providing abortions. It, it's a, uh, it's twisted. It's perverted. Uh, there's no one correct way to do any religion. That's why we have like thirty thousand types of Christianity. Um, they can't even agree. You know, are you saved at birth? Are you saved by deeds? Are you saved by donations? Are you saved in the blood of Jesus? What's the correct way to save? And sometimes the best thing you can do is if you have two Christians trying to convince you, say, why don't you two guys go off? I have, I, have, I have done that. Yeah. And when, when you when you agree on every little thing, come back to me and talk. And to the me. big it's, things. I mean, some of them don't even believe there's a heaven, right? Jehovah's Witnesses is just on earth, yeah. basically. Everyone gets zapped to dust and you yeah. live on earth. Jews don't have it. And Mormons yeah. like made a whole bizarre series of bizarre numbers of levels of heaven. And even Adolf Hitler apparently is not quite in hell. He's in yeah. like the least happy part of heaven. It's very weird. It, it's a, it's amazing stuff. And I love when people come to my door because... um. I can talk to them. It's an opportunity. Um, I once had some Jehovah's Witnesses knock on my door and I said, uh, do you guys follow the belief that 144,000 people get to go to heaven and paradise after the earth's destroyed? And they said, yes. I said, what if you convince me that you're right and I'm a better Jehovah's Witness than you are? Well, what happens? <laughs> I to you? Conflict of interest to, uh, to yeah. Yeah. Your... you shouldn't well, be bringing more people in. You're lowering your odds of getting. Do you know this thing, more. by the way, about them that I learned this recently from a YouTube video, yeah. and then I confirmed it with other Jehovah's Witnesses that that because they believe non-believers will be zapped to nothing, there will be a lot of empty houses. So if they're at your front door and they get to see your house. And they like it, like they might be arguing about each with each other who gets dibs on the house. Yeah, and why they're should they? Calling, co- why did should they try to convert you? Yeah, they're calling dibs. I, I want that house. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's just funny stuff. And then, of course, I pointed out to them. I said, uh, "Do you know why it's one hundred forty-four thousand? And they said, "No." And I said, "It's twelve thousand from each one of the twelve Jewish tribes. So you're a Jew. Which tribe are you in?" Ooh, I hadn't heard that before. Uh, my my son like in that. Sunday school, he came up with this idea. You, you may or may not know the story of the uh, temptation of Jesus where uh, the devil. All right, so Satan. we got we to gotta wrap up the show before we go into another story. So then you can, talk, you, can, you can continue with this <laughs> when we get to the hangout. So anyway, um, so those of you that are in the audience, um, please stick around because in a few minutes, we're going to move into the hangout where we're going to turn off the recording and you were free to talk freely and ask Phil questions. So we're going to be moving into that in just a few minutes. Um, Phil, thank you so much for doing this talk. Again, tell people where to find you so they can get more information about you and all that jazzy stuff. Well, uh, someone can email me, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. The, the big thing for me is the podcast, The Phil Ferguson Show. Talk about politics, religion, and money, the three things you should not discuss with your family. Uh, I teach people how to look at investments to find out if they're scams or possible scams or likely scams. I talk about politics. I talk about religion. Um, 
I do a lot of listener mail now because I've done it long enough. And I got, I guess I have enough listeners that, that the small teeny percentage that have a question, send it to me. So I often uh, address uh, listener topics via email um, and basic investing. And not only am I always regularly telling, I guess, uh, about investment scams, but I also provide information about how to invest. It's one thing to criticize all the stuff that is a joke. That's cool, but you still didn't tell me how to invest. So I do that. Some ideas and topics are for people that have lots of money and some ideas are for people that are just starting out. And since I'm in that mindset, one of the things I often tell people is um, don't use an app to invest. And I'm not going to go over it all here. I can go over it later. Uh, there's all kinds of problems with that. Um, if you want to go to one of the big mutual fund companies, Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, TD Ameritrade, I don't care. Uh, you can do almost everything that you can do on an app. You can link it to your bank. You can add $5 at a time. You can do whatever you want. You can invest in thousands of things. Uh, apps have serious problems and serious limitations and might leave you hanging out there unprotected far worse than any bank ever could. But people just don't know that. And the app doesn't tell them because why would they do that? Um, so again, kind of stick to it. But yeah, yeah, the Phil Ferguson show. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Phil. Um, RFRX will be back next week. Who will be our guest? We don't know because we double booked. <laughs> so wow. we have to figure out who the wow. guest is going to be. That's a first. Yeah. So, but it will be a great talk no matter who we have here. So please check us out next week. Same bad time, same bad channel, same bad Zoom. So please come check us um, again next week. Um, uh, most of our previous RFX recordings can be found on our YouTube channel. There's about 106. So, you know, that's pretty impressive. So if you can't get enough, of hearing us talk to wonderful people, please say, check out our YouTube channel or wherever you find your podcast, whether it's on the speaker or the Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. If again, you have questions, comments, inquiries, um, suggested topics, suggested guests, tell us how wonderful we are because we love compliments and need our ego stroked. Um, go ahead and send emails out to us again. Um, if you want to look up our blog, um, please consider going to bdm.com x communications to um, get more information about people's new conversion process and more things going on with recovering from religion. And we also we have all um, other podcasts um, things on the web at um, recoverfromreligion.org slash podcast. So Rob, you want to tell the people how to find us on the socials? Oh, we're all over social media. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, of course, our main page facebook.com slash recovering from religion that's a main facebook page that's really a cool page uh you know follow subscribe whatever they call it on facebook like like and follow then and we have a facebook support group which is facebook.com slash rfr support groups project and we're also on twitter with the handle rfr org and instagram also the same handle and on TikTok even, which is at Recovering From Religion. Thank you, Rob. So um, my Cara launches the final poll. Um, this helps us get some feedback on people that have attended, how they found us, um, all that jazzy stuff. So that's going to be launched in just a second. I can see Cara concentrating and they're going to do it. <laughs> Feel it. <laughs> Here we are. So I'm um, just going to go through the questions before I introduce Kara to do our final moment. Um, so these are rated from one to five. This program was relevant to me. Number one, screw you. I don't care. Or five, this was so relevant. I will be coming back. Number two, the speaker was clear and understandable. One, banana phone. Five, I could understand them perfectly clear. Number three, I will definitely attend future programs like this. Again, one through five, one, screw you all. I'm never coming back to five. I love being here and I want to see all of the wonderful people here again. So I will return. Number four, how did you find RFRX tonight? Okay, I can't be funny with this one. So, <laughs> so through the RFR online community Slack, through our meetup, through Facebook or Twitter, through Discord or someplace else. So we're going to let that go. Why Kara? 
um, wraps us up so I can go to the bathroom. <laughs> so go ahead, Cara. Are we, are we going to see the uh, original poll? What the oh, yeah, we should launch that. Yeah, let's, uh, let's look at the original poll. That's a good idea. We we've, we've, we forgot we introduced this feature yeah. to review. Yes, I forgot about that. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> so we're going to do that first. Then, well, Cara can close us out. <laughs> Let me pull that up. Stand by, stand by. All right, I'm going to let you guys do that because I really have to go to the bathroom. Okay, okay. okay go, go, Helen. Okay, I think I have to end this poll to show the other one. So I'm going to give y'all like about 20 more seconds to finish answering the second poll and then we will share the results of the first one so uh by the time i finish the sentence please Three, two one answering the done. questions we're still at 64 percent so i'm gonna speak real slowly so people have time to finish <laughs> and uh yeah okay Ending in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you for participating in that poll. And let me pull up the first one. All right, here we go. My computer is going extremely slow this evening, so it is struggling to keep up in real time. Let's see. Oh. Did you launch it, Rob? I did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so answer choices were interesting on this first one. So the first question was, do you have children? And if so, how many? 70% of people here said zero children. So heavily skewed towards the childless. Uh, however, there were some people that answered otherwise. 4% of people had one. 9% of people had two. 4% had three, 9% had four or more, and 4% are not sure. As a, as a member of the child uh, free group called No Kidding, I am going to bring up the point it is considered child free, not child less. Just so you know. Ah, thank you for letting me know. That yeah, makes that, sense yeah. because childless makes it sound like you're missing something. That is correct. That is correct. Excellent point. Okay, <laughs> very good you learn something new okay so question two was if you have children which was uh not the majority but if you do which of the following best describes the conversations you have with them regarding religion or skepticism and i will just mention the ones that people answered only four percent of people said that i teach them about various belief systems 13 percent of people said i teach skepticism or critical thinking 4% said I leave it up to them to make up their own mind, and 78% said not applicable or none of the above. So that includes probably most of the people that said they are child-free, as well as a few others. And the last question was, what is the ideal temperature for your swimming pool? This was the important question. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, we, we have kind of a big split, although... Uh, 35% of people put their swimming pool at less than 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Crazy. Uh, that's chilly. That sounds chilly to me. I'm from Texas. That sounds cold, but I don't know. It might depend on where you're from. 17% of people picked 86 to 88 degrees. 9% uh, of people picked 89 to 91 degrees. 22% said 92 to 94 and 17% keep it at hotter than 94 degrees. So yeah. I would I have liked know. to see so if we went have... up to the boiling temperature, if anyone would have said yes to 212. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people that did not understand that we were on Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit. versus Celsius, mm. although that would be even hotter in Celsius. So that, mm. that wouldn't really explain that answer, I no. guess now that I think about it. <laughs> Phil, did you have a comment on that question? Is there a correct answer in your mind? Uh, for me, I think it just depends on the, the season. Being here in Florida in uh, January when it becomes bitterly cold, uh, 60 degrees, uh, 
<laughs> I like I like pools to be funny. so warm that it feels like a hot tub Literally. because I, I know I've got to get out and get into that bitterly cold 60 degree air and dry yeah. off. Uh, although if it's the summer and it's 95 degrees outside and I'm in the pool for the purpose of doing laps, which is one of the reasons I bought the pool, and I've gotten very consistent so I can exercise because uh, I don't feel like I'm sweating because I'm in the pool, but uh, and when I've done laps, when it's hot outside and it's, the pool's 94, 93, 92, it's pretty darn toasty in there and it's not really refreshing. So I could see, uh, you know, during a really hot time period that uh, 90 or even 88 might be a, a better temperature, especially if you're going to work out. I did find out that uh, uh, 91 degrees was almost perfect for Marco Polo. <laughs> well, if you're, if you're really in the sports. Uh, I had a friend over with their four children and we played Marco Polo for so long that I got burned even underneath the screen, the cage that's around the pool. So we, we had good fun with that. So. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Well, there you have it, folks. Phil is our numbers guy. So ask him your numbers questions. <laughs> All right. Well, we will go ahead and wrap up and move on to the hangout here shortly, but I will do our our closing RFR moment this evening since I didn't get to do very much else this evening since uh, Rob and Helen both won the co-host showdown this week. I was to, glad to you you uh, you let us do that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you very much, Carr, for letting us yeah. in, indulge our friend. <laughs> Together, well, thank so. you both for hosting. This has been fantastic, and I feel like I got kind of a week off. So I know, lucky you. Great. I know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm excited. So, yeah, don't forget to join us next week. And uh, also, I have a couple of announcements that I want to mention. Uh, one more time, we're mentioning that uh, if you are perhaps in the Colorado area. Don't forget, April 15th, uh, Professor Bill Zuckerman is speaking on solving world problems through secular humanism at the Jefferson Humanists and Secular Hub, chapters of the American Humanist Association. Uh, he will speak on healing, as I said, healing the world through secular humanism at 7 p.m. on April 15th at Jefferson Unitarian Church in Golden, Colorado. And you can get tickets for $11 uh, at this website. I'm going to drop in the chat. So that's something that you're interested in, be sure and check that out. And don't forget, we are also having a fundraiser on May 6th of this year. It is our third annual, I believe, uh, hosted by your friendly neighborhood atheist who was a guest on our show a few weeks ago. And I'm also gonna drop the link for that. So don't forget to join us there and spread the word because this is, as we mentioned at the beginning, a completely volunteer run, donation based, nonprofit organization. And we need your help to keep the doors open and the lights on. I mean, we're actually virtual, so we don't have doors and lights, but we, we do still need to be here. Uh, we're also not getting paid for that either, but you know, it, it's all <laughs> it the takes a village. Money. It's all the atheist money that we're making. <laughs> right. Right. We do we do need all the help we can get right. to help get the word out and help reach more people. And other than that, all I have to say is thank you so much, Phil, for joining us. This was a great talk that you gave us. I was very excited to get to hear some practical applications for all of the critical thinking skills that we keep talking about uh, every now and then that you should have. And we definitely got to hear from you some situations where those would come in really handy not just when you're thinking about religious beliefs although that was part of it but also your kind of day-to-day -day situations that you might find yourself in where you need to figure out is this a scam or not what do i tell my kids and i loved how you you talked to us about helping kids find the answers themselves instead of giving them the answers and then thinking about the motivations that people might have for telling them things or telling you things and 
what is the reason that someone's giving me this information? Is there an agenda? Is there motivation? And at the same time, listening to understand instead of jumping to an immediate conclusion. And then I loved in your stories, you also describe using emotional intelligence when you're synthesizing the information and navigating your way through how to manage the situation or the conflict. And I thought those were really great skills and I am excited to hear more in the Hangouts. So once again, thank you so much for joining us.